What's up guys, this is going to be the solver module for open raising. Now since this is the first GTO module, we're going to talk very generally about when we should use GTO and we're going to talk about the tools available for solved preflop ranges. So generally we're looking to play exploitatively in every part of the game tree. When you play against tougher opponents, it's going to be a lot harder to play exploitatively in the earlier parts of the game tree. So while we may find clear exploits on the river, maybe even the turn, it's going to be a bit tougher to find a strong flop exploit against a very good opponent. And it's generally going to be hard to find a strong preflop exploit. So assuming we know our opponent is at least reasonably good and we don't have any obvious exploit on those earlier streets, it is okay to play an approximation of GTO poker. So preflop, for example, if someone's folding too much to open raises, as an example, then we know it's okay to open raise any two cards. We have an obvious exploit there. But against good opponents, it's not gonna be so straightforward. They're not gonna be folding too much. They're gonna be three betting at around the right frequencies, using the right sizings. We're not really going to have a very clear way of exploiting that player until perhaps later in the hand. So as we get to the turn, as we get to the river, they're going to hopefully be out of their depth relative to us. So although it's hard to find an exploit earlier on, we can then look to play exploitatively on the later streets. So hopefully you can see there's some context behind why we might want to make use of solved preflop ranges. Basically, our opponents might be pretty good at preflop and maybe even flop play. We don't have any obvious exploit. So in that case, it's okay to default to GTO ranges. Now you might think, well, can't we use population exploits instead to derive our preflop ranges? Well, the thing is, when we're talking about a very good player, they don't necessarily conform to population tendencies. So although we could generate an average using population tendencies, it probably isn't the best fit in that case because if our opponent's very good, he's probably not playing like population tendencies anyway. There's a reason why the majority of the population are losing players. So we're gonna think about preflop ranges. The next question players have is, well, where do I get my preflop ranges from, right? And we're gonna think about four different pieces of software which can potentially or sources that can give us our preflop ranges and we're going to think about the differences in this session as we work through gto approximations of raise first in ranges from every position at the table so at the end of this you'll have an idea of what rfi ranges look like from a gto point of view but you also have hopefully a pretty good next step for how you can access some preflop ranges in one form or the other now, as we go through this, we're going to be documenting each position. So we have the positions written down here already, and we're going to look at four sources of preflop ranges. And one of the questions we're going to answer in this session is, well, what's the difference? How similar are these ranges to each other? What kind of frequencies are we looking at? Now, let's start off with the first one there, Munker. We'll think about some of the pros and cons of these different approaches as well, since Probably some of you don't actually use solved preflop ranges at the moment, which is fine. So we're going to think about why might you choose one of these over the other. Now, advantage of Munker is although the solver itself costs 500 bucks or something similar, it has a viewer which allows you to view solved preflop ranges without having to purchase the solver. So what you can see right now is Munker viewer. And if you have a set of Munker solved preflop ranges, you can access them in the viewer without needing to purchase a solver. So we're not going to be able to run a preflop solve using Munker viewer, but if you have access to a set of already solved preflop ranges, you can look at them in Munker viewer. Now it just so happens that we have some Munker solved ranges available for free through jedipoker.io. So you can actually just grab those, grab Monka Viewer for free, and you're gonna be up and running with a free solution almost instantly. Now let's have a look at some of the frequencies here for these ranges. So if we start off with the UTG RFI, we've got a frequency there. Let's just make this full screen for now. It's not the most readable format. That could be one of the cons of this. It's not that great to look at, to be honest with you. 
but they are going to be GTO Rangers still. Have a look here, UTG, and we have RFI for 60% part, so it's going to be like 2.5x or something, presumably. 17.9%, all right? So we're just going to take a note of this here. We're going to say 17.9% for the Monkey UTG RFI range. And just as we go through, just get a feel for the types of hands that are being opened here. See some interesting, perhaps quirk to this range is that um, something like Pocket 7s is folded with 50% frequency. Having said that, the one thing that we noticed straight away is that the overall raising frequency is a little bit wider than we have with our default population exploit ranges. So we're typically coming in with about 14% of holdings. But looking at this, it seems to suggest that GTO RFI ranges are closer to 18%. So the sizing is 60% Rupma, 60% pot, which doesn't really mean a lot. We like to think in terms of 2.5x, uh, that kind of thing. So it's, it's going to be around 2.5, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong here. We'll be having a look at Snowy a bit later as well, and that's going to hopefully help clear up some of the confusion with the, the sizings. We know pot size is 3.5x, etc. So 60%, I think, is going to be about 2.5. Might not be exactly that, but roughly 2.5. Now, 18% is a bit wider, and we're probably interested in seeing where the extra width comes from, from UTG RFI, and you can see that Holdings like King 5, King 6, King 7 are opened with some frequency. Now something that's going to be a really important prerequisite to understanding these types of output when thinking about GTO point of view is that when a hand is mixed, so for example, King 7 suited here, it's saying you can open that 50% of the time from UTG, but the other 50% of the time you need to fold it. Well, if it's profitable as an open, why would we sometimes fold it? The idea here is that the EV of opening and folding must be the same. That's the only reason why we can mix a hand across two categories. So it's basically saying you should open King 7 suited, but your EV is going to be zero. See what Mr. Bolton said. Sorry to interrupt. Maybe we'll cover it. I've tried Monker Viewer, but couldn't get any ranges to import. Do you have to purchase the Monker software in order to view or store ranges with it? So this kind of touches on what we were saying in the sense that there's two aspects to this. And you'll see it's the same with PO Solver, which we're not gonna look at right now. There's the solver component, and then there's the viewer component. That's also another popular solver, but doesn't do so good for preflop solves. It only does heads up preflop. So we won't be looking at that in the session, but same kind of idea. You have the solver component, which is what you typically pay for, so you can run your own solves. Then you have the viewer component. And the idea is the viewer, so that could be PO viewer or monker viewer in this case, is completely free. So if you already have access to the ranges, everything's free. So what you're looking at right now is a completely free solution to viewing preflop ranges. It might not be the best option. You see there's some other options in this session. If you've had problems getting them running, that's something that we can work through after the session potentially, but just know you don't need to pay out any money to access what you're seeing on the screen right now. I know this because I've never personally purchased anything from Monka Solver and I didn't even purchase these preflop ranges. I honestly can't remember where they came from originally, but they were given to me at some point. So we can see there's some extra width here with hands we won't typically open with our exploit ranges like King 10 offsuit, Ace 9 offsuit, Ace 10 offsuit we don't even open. So you can see even against good players, you might be able to push that UTG RFI frequency up to 18%. So if you're doing database analysis and it's at 17, 18%, technically you're not doing anything wrong there. It's GTO correct. And if we can open this kind of range against very good players, then we can also open this kind of range against weaker players as well. But keep in mind that there might be good reason to open less than this because do we really care about hands that play at zero EV? We're not trying to play perfect GTO correct poker here. We're probably not going to be exploited if we don't have King 5 suited in our RFI range with some frequency. So we could just say, actually, we don't care about any of these hands that are mixed in this case. Anyway, we've got the frequency here. Uh, we're just going to notate from the other spots as well. I think maybe the best thing to do is to introduce each software and add the frequency. And then once we've done that, we can kind of speed up. So this is the next tool, and this is Snowy. Now, Snowy is a little bit different from the other three in the group. 
So Munker is an example of a GTO solver, or at least the solver component of it is. Uh, GTO wizard, which we'll look at, is actually an abstraction. It's not a solver itself, but it displays data in a very readable format from solves that were run using JE Solver. Not really sure what the pronunciation is. Don't know if it's uh, JE Solver or something like that, but JE Solver, I've only seen it written down. It actually uses that solve, which is very similar to Peer Solver. Apparently it has a slightly more efficient algorithm, uh, but it's another type of GTO Solver. So GTO Wizard is based on JE Solver run solves in the background and displays the data in a nice format for us via a web app. We'll get to that. But underlying that technology is a GTO solver. Texas solver. You probably never heard of this. And in my mind, this is probably the coolest solution on the list. We'll get to that shortly. But it is once again based on a GTO solver. OK, so Snowy, what is the difference between Snowy and the other three on the list? Snowy is not technically a GTO solver. Snowy is what's known as a neural network. So just to illustrate the differences here, a GTO solver uses an algorithm. So it takes ranges and it iterates using an algorithm until what's known as a Nash equilibrium is reached. Now Nash equilibrium, it's GTO lingo for a situation where no poker player has any incentive to deviate from their current strategy. Put simply, it uses a calculation method. It's like a poker calculator. It's based on maths. It runs this algorithm. The end result is this perfect GTO Nash equilibrium strategy. So how is Snowy different? Snowy is not a calculator as such. The idea behind Snowy, it's a neural network. It plays trillions of hands against itself and looks at the EV. So to give an example, it picks up Ace King Offsuit preflop. It folds it and says, well, what's the EV of that? The EV of folding ace-king offsuit was zero. Maybe the next time it picks up ace-king, open raises to two big blinds and says, hey, what's the EV of that? Takes a note of the EV. Then it tries open limping, takes a note of the EV. Keeps doing that. Eventually it figures out, you know what? Folding ace-king from the button, not really such a good play because average EV hits zero, whereas when I open, I get a high EV. So it keeps doing that over trillions of hands and it's basically learning as it goes along. It's seeing which lines generate the highest EV. And after you've done that enough, what you end up with is something quite similar to a GTO solution. It's just not based around the concept of Nash equilibrium. It's based around the concept of always taking the line which has the higher EV, which is very similar to the idea of GTO poker as well. So a slightly different tool. Let's have a look at the recommended raise first in range from UTG. Uh, we can see it there on the screen. Uh, let's have a look at, in fact, we need to choose half pot, I think. Let's have a look at the recommended raising range. So 17.66 recommended for snowing. Now this is I'm not sure really if this is what you're expecting, but taking two completely different methods of trying to arrive at a mathematical conclusion regarding the best opening range from UTG. Well, this is pretty interesting, right? 17.9 versus 17.66. That's very, very similar, right? And we kind of get the feeling, well, GTO solution must probably be somewhere around that, right? If two different methods are arriving at the same result. Let's see if we get the same kind of similar results as we go through the different positions. Um, let's just have a look at the range again. And in terms of sizing, if I just create a new scenario here in Snowy, so the idea here is uh, you can create your own scenarios and see what the solver would do in those situations. I'll call it solver, but we all know it's a neural network, not really a solver. One of the cool things about this is Poker Snowy tries stuff that wouldn't appear as part of another preflop solution. So for example, if I'm looking at Monka Solver trying to figure out what should I do against an open limp, for example, well, Monka Solver is not going to tell me because solved preflop ranges don't make use of open limps. They're not included in the tree because it's generally just considered that open limping apart from the small blind is incorrect. So it's not included as an option as part of the solve when you're using things like Monka, for example. But Poker Snow, he's tried everything. Poker Snow, he's tried limping, so it knows how to play against the limp, that kind of thing. So it actually has opinions on situations which are not based around GTO. So that's 
one possible example of using a piece of software like Snowy, like a neural network. Uh, the downsides are you generally find people, for some reason, I don't know why, they look down on neural networks. They usually say things like, quote, it's not a real solver. I guess it's not a real solver because it's a neural network. Whether that means the information is not useful, well, that's down to you to decide, but it's kind of interesting we're getting a very similar result right now. Another disadvantage is this option is going to come with a price tag. I think for the pro version, which is what we have right now, I think it's something like 200, 250 bucks for a year subscription. And you might think, well, okay, let me just pay for one month and uh, get all the preflop ranges. It doesn't work like that. They only offer a year subscription at the time of making this webinar. So you're going to have to pay for your subscription. Having said that, they do have a free GTO preflop trainer and you can actually download it as an app for your phone. So I think it's both for iOS and Android. There's actually a Poker Snowy app where you can just check out some of the preflop solutions on the go and you don't actually have to pay anything for it. So that's a fairly elegant solution for some basic preflop stuff from a neural network. Again, there's no price tag on that. You can just get the app from the iOS App Store or from the Android App Store and you're good to go with some preflop solutions. Now let's have a look at how this is going to work. So uh, you can see we're playing, in fact we're going to set it to 50 cent one dollar just because I think it's easier to follow a lot of us playing big blind so we have one dollar as the big blind here. Now if I click half pot uh, you can see it's 2.25 right? So I guess 60% pot's going to be a bit more than that. It might not be a full 2.5. Uh, quarter pot's going to be a min raise. Uh, let's see what the recommended option is here in terms of sizing as well. So it actually recommends the min raise from this position at the table. You can see it's, it wants quarter pot, I think. Let's just confirm that. Let's just see range advice. It's recommending quarter pot 17.66. So coming in for a min raise. And snow was actually 2.5. I guess it might be good to just track some of this. So 60% pot, right? I don't want to confuse it too much, actually. So maybe I'll just leave them as they are, but just keep in mind Monk is 60%, whereas Snowy's technically recommending a min raise there. The way that Snowy works is it will only ever use one bet sizing range at the same time. So you could consider that as a disadvantage as well, but you can see how it would play at another bet sizing range. So if we force Snowy to open raise for half pot instead of quarter pot, uh, we can see that actually it's recommended raising frequency drops to 16.73. So that might be a better value to compare with Monk is 16%. So from this perspective, it's actually opening slightly tighter than Munker. Yeah, the effective stacks are still at 200, right? That's a good point. So if I add the players now after, after that, yeah, well spotted there, Modesto. So let's have a look at the range advice. Does it change based on that? So you can see 17.15 so it has actually changed a little bit based on the effective stack so let's just fix that 17.15 okay let's move on to our next option here let's just check half pop before we do that so 15.13 so it might be it might be slightly more accurate to call this 15.13 um actually we'll keep it as the min raise sizing uh, because as you'll see, I think the other GTO solutions are using min raises more commonly from this position. So the monk is actually going to be a bit larger. So let's just double check with monk that it wasn't min raise. Yeah, 60%. So it is like 2.4 or whatever it is. Okay. So moving on to the next option, we've got GTO solver, GTO wizard even. Uh, let's bring this up. Now, what you're going to see at the moment is actually the web app version of this which is like the new thing where it's basically a browser-based app, but not running within the browser, like within its own contained browser. And we're gonna have a look at the raising range. Let me just switch this over to um, strategy mode here. Now, what you're seeing right now is not a solver. It's displaying data from the output of a JE solve. And um, you can see raise size recommended here is min raise. Now, one thing to keep in mind that they have different solves based on rake and based on post flop sizings. So for example, we're looking at the general 50 NL solve right now, which is probably going to be a bit tighter than the 500 NL solve because we have higher rake. That's okay. If anything, I always say let's are on the side of playing too tight rather than playing too loose. So 
we're going to use the NL50 data here, but you could check NL500. It's not hugely different, but it is a bit wider. And of course, the result of any preflop solve is going to be dependent on the type of tree that was used post-flop. So you can see different trees here with different post-flop sizing. So the general has a few different sizings post-flop. Uh, you can see post-flop sizing says 3 to 6, whereas if you look at the complex tree, it's got 12 to 19 post-flop sizings. Honestly feels like a bit of overkill when you're working through those models. And interestingly, the impact on preflop strategy is not really that large. We still end up with very similar preflop ranges, whether we have 12 to 19 post-flop sizings or just 3 to 6. So we're just going to use general NL50 for now. Um, we have this range here. Let's have a look at the raising frequency first of all. Just going to go back to the correct range, which is just here. Actually, this is the UTG RFI range. Min raise 17.6. Okay. So once again, very, very similar regardless of the solution that we're using. Now we're kind of interested in those pocket pairs from Monka Solver. It seems to sometimes be folding hands as strong as sevens if we just recap on that. So you can see sevens was 50-50 split, which honestly doesn't resonate with me that hard. Like I feel sevens is just a standard open. Um, with our explosive ranges, we fold something like fives and lower. We open sixes plus, which seems to match up with this data because sixes plus is pure. Um, now let's talk about the pros and cons of this format. Uh, one of the advantages here is that we are able to see the EV. So if we have a look at sixes, in fact, although it's a have a look over on the right hand side we can see the ev there of the different options now although it is a pure open um it's actually saying the ev is zero let's see if that's true of sevens as well sevens is only marginally plus ev so actually it kind of mirrors what monk is telling us i mean you've got to remember that these solves aren't 100 percent accuracy so if it's saying that with this level of accuracy the ev of sevens is 0 0.05 in fact you can see it on the main whole cards grid it's very, very reasonable that it could end up being zero depending on how accurate the solve is, in which case it could end up being mixed, right? So that's something just to be aware of, is that the EV of some of these opens is very low. Like we kind of think of sixes and sevens as slam dunk opens, but according to this, you're barely making any money. Now, pros and cons. One of the advantages of this format is it's just the most visually appealing of them all, I would say. And it has many different ways of breaking down the data. So for example, if I go to this EV option, I can see a heat map. And I think this really just helps to see, well, what are the core hands in the RFI range? I mean, anything that's in an orange or red color is just not that important, even if we open it. The only things that are actually crucial as part of the RFI range against most opponents is stuff that's either yellow or green. You could actually get away with folding anything that's not either yellow or green on this heat map. Um, which is obviously a significantly tighter range than the overall range. So just to uh, go between the two, so there's the heat map, there's the strategy plus EV with the whole range in. So you can see all of these suited aces that are in the raising range are basically making no money. If you have a look at the heat map, they're all orange slash red, really not that important. I'm not saying don't open them. I think you should try and play pretty close to the overall range when you're UTG. But the point is, it's easy to see how if someone was just playing way too tight from these positions, they're still going to do okay because we don't really care that much about balance when raising first in pre-flop, at least not unless our opponents are very good. But many of the hands around the edge are close to zero EV anyway, so our winner is not going to change if we don't open them, for example. Okay, Rootmer says, Gicho Wizard opened 17.3 with 2.5x. Okay, so just to be clear, you can see GTO Wizard is mid-raising here from UTG, okay? It's going to use different sizings later on, so I think it uses 2.5 from the button. You can see right now it's using a mid-raise, okay? The NL50 complex ranges. Okay, I mean, we're not going to look at them right now. Let's see what your question is. Why is there such a small difference between a mid-raise and 2.5x? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Is it part of the tree or is it just part of the fact that the situation doesn't really change that much when you've got five guys still to act before you, right? Maybe it's going to have a more in, more significant difference when you are on the button. It's a perfectly good question. So it could be to do with the tree, could be to do with the situation on the table.
And in fact, I don't think a lot of the positions really change that much for RFI if we tweak the sizing. So it's a very, very good question and something that you can explore. Uh, right now, we're just going to try and get a general overview of the different RFI ranges and compare the solvers. So that's maybe like a topic for like an advanced discussion on this, I reckon. Okay, let's have a look at Texas Solver. Now, I said this was my favorite on the list. Uh, what is Texas Solver? Let's have a look. So Texas Solver is apparently, according to them anyway, this is the first open source GTO solver. It kind of looks a little bit like Pyro Solver or PO Solver. When you have a look at Postflop, it's kind of like a less polished version of PO Solver, but obviously PO Solver comes with a 500 to 1K price tag. Whereas this is completely open source and free. The other thing that's very, very interesting to me with this is that it ships with a complete set of solved preflop ranges. In fact, three sets of solved preflop ranges. So guys currently are going online and shelling out 500 bucks or so for, you know, solved monker ranges and stuff like that. And here, I got this off the GitHub page, by the way. They just have a completely free solver. They've tested the results against other solvers like PO Solver and they, they pretty much have the same result. So it's a very decent solver. It's probably as good as PO Solver, if not better. Apparently it's like better than PO Solver in some respects, but looking at the spec, it seems to have a higher memory consumption. It seems to use about twice as much memory, but then it solves faster. So probably is an advantage overall, unless you're building very big trees and have limited RAM, in which case that's a disadvantage, I guess. Completely free right now. It comes with Windows Executable, so you can install it on Windows. Also comes with uh, Mac OS installer and Linux as well. You can just clone the Git repo and install it on whichever Linux flavor you're on. So it seems to be the solver that performs the best over multiple operating systems as well. So you can run it on Mac if you want to. And also completely scriptable as well. I mean, this GUI what we see now, the graphic user interface was actually built on top of the original command line solvers. You can actually run this completely from the command line and you basically provide it with uh, JSON files as input and it could just function via the command line. You can completely script it as well. So a lot of advantages to this format. Completely free, I guess downsides are maybe it's not as polished looking as something like GTO Wizard. Um, I guess another drawback to GTO Wizard, by the way, is the price tag. Um, if anything, it could end up being the most expensive on the list that we've looked at today. Something like 80 bucks a month. And that's their discount price. I think it's going to be 100 plus. They do have versions available which cost less. But given this is something that you can actually access open source these days, is it really worth paying a hundred bucks a month when you can just download this free from GitHub? And you might think, well, okay, it's free. The preflop solves aren't going to be any good, right? It's free. Okay. Let's have a look. In fact, I'm not sure whether these preflop solves were generated by the solver or whether they're just uh, preflop ranges that you've been given that you can then use as part of the postflop solve, um, which is pretty decent and matches up with PO solver according to them. Uh, let's have a look at some of the ranges here. In fact, what I did just to show you one range in the grid, but um, you know, you'll see that there isn't as much data available here in terms of uh, like, what is the overall RFI frequency here? It doesn't tell us, right? At least I don't think it does. I can't see it anywhere. Um, just to see how you'd access this. If we go into UTG, uh, 2.5 X is a based around. And then before we can see the RFI range, we'd have to choose a different position and say, let's just say big blank calls, for example. And then what we have here is the two ranges that you can take to the post flop solve. So you've got the big blind cold calling range, which we're not interested, but then the UTG RFI range, which looks like this. We still don't know what frequency it is. So I've actually put this into Flopzilla uh, so you can compare. So if we go to UTG and have a look at, uh, this is actually the Texas solver range. I forgot to label it TS. Let's just have a look. 17.6. So, I mean, look at that, right? 17.6. We will double check that. It almost seems crazy that it's exactly the same as the... Yeah, I mean, they're different ranges, right? This is um, the general 15L solutions for GTO Wizard. And this is Texas Solver. 
you can see very minute differences between the ranges. And the thing that I'm really enjoying right now is that the RFI frequency is exactly 17.6 for both. I mean, just looking at those results, the only difference here is that this was a 2.5x, right? So you can say, actually, it's not the same. That's just a coincidence. You're focusing on things that aren't relevant there. This is 2.5, so it's technically um, opening wider uh, because GTO is it's two big blinds. But, you know, as um, Root Mo was saying, maybe the sizing doesn't really have a big impact on, on the UTG R5 frequency, so we could just compare these directly. Now, just to have a look at that range, once again, let's see what's happening with these pocket pairs. Very similar, like surprisingly similar. We looked at some of the landscape of this and we're seeing things like, okay, like sixes is mixed, sevens is sometimes mixed. We're seeing the same thing here. King five suited, opening with some frequency, all the suited aces opening, um, ace 10 offsuit, stuff like that. Even king 10 offsuit, if we just trace that combo um, through the different solvers. So we had, um, Here's Monka Solver, King 10 Offsuit is mixed. Here it's mixed. Um, let's see what Snowy was again. Uh, Snowy doesn't have King 10. That was, that was actually the tightest. So Snowy's kind of like the odd one out there in that case. I mean, it's still a pretty good range. And then here, King 10 is again cut out of this range, but they it has ace 10 and it has king jack mixed. Actually has queen jack mixed there. So does this one. Um, so you can see very, very similar overall. So you've got four options there. Um, out of the options that I've shown you today, um, two of them are completely free. All right, Monka, you can just download the viewer. You can grab the sold ranges from jedipoker.io, which you know usually get sold for like 500 bucks a pop, that kind of thing. Texas Solver, which I'm very excited about, completely free. Just goes to show you don't need to charge like a thousand bucks to have um, Solver software. Uh, Snowy, there's like a free preflop app which you can get for your mobile device. Um, but if you want to get the subscription, you have to buy a year and it's either a hundred or 200 bucks, uh, depending on which version you get. Um, obviously, these are going to have post-op solutions as well, like all of these. Um, this monk of you is just for the preflop range. This is one include post-op solutions. Um, Texas Solve, you can run any post op solution you want. Uh, GTO Wizard is going to be about 100 bucks a month. So that's by far the most expensive and debatable whether it's worth it. But I have to say, the GUI is very cool. And, you know, access to 5 million plus post flop pre solve trees on demand. I guess you get what you pay for, right? It's like a premium product for a premium price. SB says preflop solves from Wizard are also free. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. I'm really glad you brought that up because I've completely ignored that very important point. Um, GTO Wizard has free preflop solves. This is actually not the free version we're looking at right now, but a lot of this preflop stuff, uh, you can get completely free. So really should have mentioned that. Thanks for pointing that out, SB. Uh, GTO Wizard. I don't think you can access all of the preflop solves, but you can access some of them completely for free. And as you've seen, there's, there's not really a lot to compare in terms of the frequencies, but I tell you what, let's compare the other positions before we jump to any conclusions to see if there's any bigger differences. But, um, so basically both Snowy and Wizard have a free option. So you've got two completely free options here and two paid options with a free component. So up to you whether you go for a free option or shell out some cash on something a bit more expensive. Okay. Let's have a look at the other positions. So we've gone through every, option here. I mean, there are more options available online. I've just gone through the four that I'm familiar with personally. If you have any questions about these options or any other options, feel free to type them in the chat. We're going to kind of see if we can power through now and get the frequencies for the other positions. I think from this point onwards, we'll try and just get the, the frequencies by solver. So we'll get all of the positions here for Munker and then compare them. Okay. So I've always found the interface is not that great for for finding the range you want here in Monka Viewer. What you actually have is a type of tree here. So if we want to see MP open raise, we have to specify first of all that um, UTG is going to fold. All right. And now what we have here is the RFI range for UTG. So I've clicked on the fold node there. UTG plus one, which is MP in this case, we got 21.7. Okay. So let's just put that down there. 
feel free to take a note of the preplot range. You can always, if you're watching the webinar afterwards, you can always screenshot this stuff if you want to uh, get a more in-depth comparison. So now, obviously, if you want to see the cutoff RFI range, we're going to have to go to the node where MP folds as well. So now we're at cutoff RFI, which you can see here, 28.2. And we know this is 60% open. So I think it's just under 2.5. And now if we go to the cutoff fold node, we get the button RFI, which is 42.5 in this case. And finally, we end up with a small blind. Now, the small blind is going to be a little bit trickier to compare, and we will come back to this when we think about the solver module for small blind completes. Depending on the tree, the small blind may or may not have the option to call in the small blind. Um, so we'll find out very shortly if that's the case, because we're going to go to the fold node for the button here. Right. Now, what we're seeing straight away here is we've got the small blind RFI range, but it's very clear that there is no complete option here. We've got 43.6 RFI and no complete hands. Now, is that because Monka Solver says completing the small blind is a bad idea? No, it's because whoever has built the preflop tree when running the preflop solve did not include the option to complete in the small blind. Now, there are potentially valid reasons why someone might do this. The problem with running a preflop solve, because you might think, well, why can't I just run my own preflop solve? It's very, very resource intensive. So we're talking about at the low end, you might be able to run a light preflop solve with 256 gigabytes of RAM. Now keep in mind, average user system for people here is probably anywhere between about eight gigabytes of RAM and maybe 64 gig at the high end. But to be honest, I'm guessing most of you guys probably have a system with like 16 or 32 gig of RAM. That would be kind of normal, right? And you can definitely get by with less RAM. So even if you have a fairly fast system and you've got like 64 gig of RAM in terms of memory, you're not even touching the minimum requirements for running a preflop solve. Now the problem is as we add more options to preflop, because we said that's a light preflop solve. So as we add more options to the preflop solve, you know, for example, including things like small blind complete, cold calling ranges for every position, because a light preflop solve doesn't have cold calling ranges for every position, usually just the big blind. The tree size grows very, very quickly to the point where you could have requirements for a terabyte of RAM to run a preflop solve. So this is kind of why people make these types of shortcuts. Is this a good shortcut to make? I would say possibly not because we know from our other studies that small blind complete is a pretty big part of the game. So would I exclude that from the, from the post flop tree? No, I wouldn't because I want to see what complete ranges look like here in the spot. You can see in this case, we don't have that. That's fine. Not a problem. Um, let's just take a note of the RFI frequency from the small blind here, which is 43.6%. Okay, let's just get some questions before we fill the rest of this. So preflop souls from Wizardgate. We've covered that. Uh, a lot of regs open, 42% from the button are very close to it, right? So, you know, one thing we're seeing here from this Monka result is if you think about our exploitative preflop ranges, it's 48% button RFI, right? Is that GTO correct? No, that's actually more aggro than GTO. We'll confirm with the other solvers to see if they match up. But technically, we're not supposed to open that aggressively from the button. We just do it for exploitative reasons. Mr. Bolster says, do GTO Plus or Cutter and ZV have a preflop solve option? They do not. And you might think, well, isn't that a huge limitation, right? You know, I've paid for the solver. Why doesn't it solve preflop stuff? It's just because practically it's a very, very specific requirement. 99.99% of users are not even going to have the right system to run that. And if they're the kind of person that wants to run that and they have this huge, powerful system, with, you know, 500 gig of RAM or something like that, or a terabyte of RAM, which they presumably rented from the cloud, for example, for the specific purpose of running preflop ranges, then I guess the general consensus is they can shell out 500 bucks for preflop solver. So although we have an open source Hold'em solver, we, we don't have an open source preflop solver yet, as far as I'm aware. So that's still considered a very, very specialist activity. Uh, lots of poker players these days run post-flop solves, but only a very small percentage of players run preflop solves. 
Um, not because we're not interested in preflop ranges, it's just because it's very expensive to do that. At the very least, you're going to have to hire out an expensive cloud system. You know, kitting your own office with this kind of technology is going to be very expensive and probably not recommended if you just want one pre preflop solve, for example. Okay, let's move over to Snowy. And let's see what Snowy thinks, the neural network, in terms of frequencies. Now I'm hoping I can just do this as we go along. So we're going to make UTG fold, and then we're going to have a look at the preflop advice for MP. And you can see the grid there. We actually want to see the range. So let's go to range advice. And we can see recommended 20.13. Notice as well that it's now recommending half pot. So for UTG, it's recommending two big blinds. For this position, it's recommending half pot. So it's actually saying, as you get to later positions, size up. And, you know, this is something that poker players have been talking about over the last, specifically over the last year or two years, because the general consensus was always, if you're in early position, you open larger, but when you get to late position, you open smaller. And people would generally cite some kind of unprovable reason, which didn't make too much sense. Like, oh yeah, you should open raise larger from UTG because your range is stronger, whatever that means. Yeah, you should open raise smaller from the button because your range is weaker. That's not necessarily a reason to open smaller, by the way. It's just some made up reason that people used to cite for why they were doing something. What we generally see across a lot of solvers now is that the later position, the larger the sizing, the largest RFI sizing is from the small blind, followed by the button, then the cuts off, then MP, then UTG. So UTG, if you want to GTOify your game, you want to start by coming in for a min raise more often from UTG and actually sizing up on the button. Now, exploitatively, you don't always have to do that. I do still, for example, if um, if I'm opening the button purely for a steal attempt because there's tight players in the blinds or because there's a fish in the blinds, so I just want to open raise wider, I will still min raise on the button. But for my standard button RFI range, I recommend sizing up. A lot of evidence points towards that being the best way of playing is like the 2.5x on the button or even 3x if you want to. But what we're seeing a lot of solvers do is 2.5 on the button, 3 from the small blind, something like 2.3 from the cutoff, and then a min raise from UTG and MP. So usually MP is still going to be a min raise, but we can see Snow is actually sizing up slightly from MP. Uh, the frequency, 20.13. So again, fairly close to Munker. So if we fold that position now, uh, we can have a look at the cutoff RFI range. Let's have a look at the grid first of all. So you can see there is the raise first in grid. You know, one of the things that kind of interests me about this is I wouldn't say this is the best preflop grid. Like if you want to figure out what holdings are what, you kind of have to trace it down. And, you know, I, I don't think the way the human brain works is they just look at a point in this grid and they instantly know which hole card it is. The funny thing about this is there's actually a Mac OS version of Poker Snowy. And the whole card grid is so much nicer to look at and it's properly labeled and anything and everything. I don't know why they've done it that way, why the Windows version never got upgraded, even though it has most of the features. I've got no idea. Um, this is not my best whole card grid viewing experience, I have to say. Okay, let's have a look at the frequency for the cutoff. We'll go to range advice and we see 25.36. So we're seeing snow is kind of tight in general. But I think one thing I just want to recap on is that this is a rate scenario. Okay, so just keep that in mind. It might loosen up a bit if we were to check this box, no rake. Uh, we're not going to do that right now, though. So cutoff, we're going to fold the cutoff now. Let's have a look at the button RFI grid. Looks like this. Let's have a look at the frequency. It is 36.4. So that's really tight, right? But the one thing I want you to notice here is recommending a pot size open. I wonder what happens if you make a half pot. I would almost be tempted to just use the half pot button because it's kind of closer to um, what's being used by the others. In fact, I'm going to do that. But the one thing that I want you to note here is the pattern that's most interesting to take away here is the size up that's occurring as we get to later position. So you can see this really strong tendency to size up when we get to the button rather than size down. And most GTO solvers are using 2.5 on the button, but Snow is saying, no, use pot size, use pot size on the button. I've run my neural network algorithm over and over again. 
and I've discovered that I make more money when I 3.5x the button. Is Snowy right, or are the sizings that are used in most GTO solvers correct, 2.5? Uh, we don't know, actually. Because one of the things that we don't know is, when a solver uses 2.5 on the button, is that because the the person who solved the ranges has tried a bunch of different sizings and found out that the solver prefers 2.5, or have they just given the solver a 2.5x open and never tried a pot size open the button? Because sometimes we don't try stuff that seems logical, right? So if I was building a preflop tree, just on level one, I'm not gonna give the button a 10 big blind raise first in option, because in my mind, that's probably not gonna be the best option. But I'm kind of prejudging there. Now, I don't think 10 big blinds is gonna be the best option probably significantly inferior to some of the other sizings, I guess. But the point is, we don't always try stuff if it seems illogical. So why aren't solvers opening to 3.5? Well, it could be that no one's designed a tree that way or not many players have tried designing a tree with that sizing. So once again, we see some interesting quirks with Poker Snowy. Poker Snowy tries everything. Over those trillions of hands, it's tried a 10 big blind button open. It's tried a 50 big blind button open, um, well, it hasn't actually done that. It's tried pot and two pot because it has preset sizings. But um, the point is, it's tried these different sizes. It's tried 2x pot um, on the button, for example, which GTO solvers won't, won't really be given that option. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to use the half pot sizing just so these numbers match up a bit better because... I don't think any of the other solutions are going to be using a pot size open, but just keep in mind that technically Snow is saying open for pot, uh, but only open 36% of hands. All right, so that's an interesting result. 39.12. Okay, and finally, let's have a look at small blind. Now, I think Snow is going to have a complete option in the small blind. Let's have a look at the preflop advice. Yes, yeah, so look at this. You've got raise in green and cool in yellow. I'm going to see the overall width of this range is very wide. And this is kind of what we expect. We know that it's possible to place 70% of holdings or so in a small blind. And Snowy's basically saying, do that. Play how many percent this is. We're going to find out right now. What, what exact percent is Snowy recommending? So if we go to range advice, let's have a look. So we have raised pot 40% of holdings. Okay, so that's the RFI value. And then we've got 20% complete. So it's actually more like 60%. It's not 70%. Um, let's see what happens if we tell Snowy to use a small open sizing. It doesn't really change that much. It's still around 60%, but it now basically says, well, if, if you're gonna make me use a small open sizing, I'm not gonna open anything. I'm just gonna cool everything. So basically Snowy's saying, small open raise sizing from the small blind, not very good. And I guess the idea is that it just gives the big blind too good of a price to continue. There's actually a reason why you wanna size up slightly in this spot. And that's going to be a common theme, like a GTO oriented theme, especially when we start thinking about three bet sizings OOP. We just see this general trend towards not allowing our opponent to continue too cheaply when he's in position. So we're just looking at a preflop application of that now. But as we look at some of the later GTO modules, we'll see other manifestations of that particular GTO principle. But Snowy's basically saying, I've got to open raise at least pot size, otherwise, I just don't want to open at all. You're not making it worth my while in this case. Don't want to play this small pot OP with a high frequency, basically. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down this um, 39.7 here for the RFI. But let's just take a quick note of the small blind complete. We're not going to look at that in depth right now. That will be a separate module. But just for the sake of completeness, let's type 20.43 in brackets. We know that, that is the complete range. And let me just check if there's any questions. Yeah, I think that part of it, later position, the higher the chance of playing position post flop. So it's just more profitable to open raise in later positions and we can invest more as a result. I think that's basically the idea. If you think about when you open UTG, I mean, there's so much of the time you're gonna get three bet or squeezed off your hand or you're gonna be playing multi-way, stuff like that. It's just a lower quality situation to be in. It's not as profitable overall. We don't wanna invest as much. Who thought poker could ever be that simple, right? If it's a profitable situation, invest more money. If it's not a profitable situation, i.e. you're in UTG, then don't invest too much. It's not very profitable, right? Very, very simple. In fact, sometimes 
these concepts can be so simple that players have a hard time believing it. Like, surely it's not that simple, right? Just open larger if it's a better spot. Okay, let's move on to GTO Wizard and let's start getting in some of these RFI ranges from GTO Wizard. So we're making sure we're using the right ranges. So we're using the general NL50 ranges and let's see if we can make this any bigger to improve experience here. Oh, it's not working for me, unfortunately. Right, so let's have a look at the hijack raising range. You can see on the screen right now, 21.6. I think one thing you'll probably see straight away is this is a, a much faster experience as well. Like the, the work required to navigate through different parts of the game tree and see a GTO solution. It, it certainly is faster. I guess that is one of the pros of this is like, there we go. Now we're at the cutter fire fire range. Notice the size up as well. We've got two, two, and then 2.3 here and 28.9 recommended. Okay, button, so we're just going to fold the cut off now and button is going to raise, We've got 42%. So very, very similar to the monk result there. And finally, small blind. So let's have a look at this. Now we're expecting a complete and raise amalgamation here of different results. And you see, that's what we're getting. And if we look up, up in the top right, we can see the distribution. So we've got raise three, 37.5 and cool 11%. So this is actually surprisingly tight to the point where I actually just want to double check this. So we've got 37.5% and we've got cool 11.1. .1. Actually, let me just fix this. So I meant to put this in brackets. I don't know why it's come out as negative. So let's put that. Oh, of course. Yeah. When you do like accounting, like putting something in brackets means that it's a deficit or something like that. All right. Let me just abandon that. So yeah, 37.5 and 11.1. .1. So let's just have a look at that in a bit more detail. Make sure we've got everything right here. Yeah. Interesting. It's, it's a very tight range. And we'll see if it ties in with the, the last remaining range as well. So yeah, we can see raise 37.5, cool 11.1. .1. So it's kind of working out about 50%. Um, let's have a look at the heat map of this, just out of curiosity. Yeah, I mean, it could potentially end up being wider. I mean, there's, I see some hands in the pure folding range, apparently. Actually, they're not pure folds. They're just defended at a very low frequency. The EV is very low here. So interesting result here. That's certainly tighter than we'd expect for that. Um, and, you know, it doesn't change the fact that you can exploitatively complete very wide. So don't get those two concepts confused. Doesn't mean you want to tighten up in the spot or anything. So let's have a look at the Texas Solver ranges. We're actually going to do this in Flopzilla because of being transferred over, so it shouldn't be too difficult. MP, RFI. So remember, we've got the two different ranges to compare here. So if you want to compare them to the Poker Wizard ranges, you can see that they're, they're very similar here. There's just a little difference with the mixing, but we're basically looking at the same range here. So this is 21.5, and you can see Wizard is 21.6. So 21.5%. Uh, let's have a look at Cutoff. So... Again, if you want to see the difference, this is Texas Solver and this is Poker Wizard. Basically the same range. I mean, there's, there's some differences. I mean, you probably don't want to obsess over why Poker Wizard is opening Jack Nine offsuit from this spot with a 10% frequency or whatever it is. But Texas Solver, Texas Solver is saying, no, I'm going to open 10 Nine offsuit for that same frequency, but not Jack Nine. Like these are probably just to do with the accuracy of the solve rather than anything meaningful. So let's have a look at our action range 27.8 here for uh, Texas Solver. Uh, button. So we have for Texas Solver 41.5. And the small blind. Okay, let's have a look. Now, I think, I have a feeling, if we just go back to the source for this, for the small blind RFI ranges, I don't think there's a complete option here. 
Uh, so let's just see if we can get to the bottom of that. So let's have a look. Small blinds. Yeah, you can see there's only a three big blind option, which means that there's no limping going on here. Let's just check some of the other trees. Yeah, in fact, I think you can only display one range here. I can't see anything to do with small blind limping. So this is another range that's just going to have RFI. So let's have a look at that RFI range for the small blind. And if we compare it to Texas Solver, they're again pretty similar. I mean, Texas Solver, this is Texas Solver here that you can see. And this is the Poker Wizard, which seems a lot more heavily mixed in this case. Well, it will be because it's got a limping range in, I guess. So you can't really compare these directly. So 42.7 as the RFI. And no small blank complete. So we'll just put zero for these small blank complete. So of the overall defending ranges, we can see that this was working out about 60 overall defend, and this was only working out about 50. So um, it might be that we can't actually play 70% of holdings from this position. Having said that, just out of curiosity, if we just go back to our GTO wizard, um, let's check out the high limit solutions, right? We know there's going to be a lot of hands that are pretty close around the, the edge. Let's go to L500 and look at the general solutions there. And let's have a look at small blind in the spot. And 33.8 raise and 17.8 cool. So where does that take us? It takes us to like 51% or something. And just so you can see, there's not really a big difference, right? I mean, the rake has obviously changed the frequencies. We play more hands now from the small blind um, with this grid by a few percent but it hasn't really made a big impact and you can also see it's still saying play 50 percent of holdings from the small blind so it does seem that that 70 percent amount of hands from the small blind while it's okay exploitatively and we could even play 100 percent of hands against fish that does seem to be one of those stats that's been estimated on the high side and maybe you can't quite play 70 percent of holdings from the spot from a gto perspective i mean let's just check one more grid out of curiosity uh let's check the complex here for NL500 if they exist. Let's find out. And let's have a look at recommended small blinds here and see the frequencies. Yeah, if anything, that's even tighter, right? That's going to be like 45% in this spot. So yeah, so I, I think at most it's going to be somewhere between 50 and 60. I mean, Snowy's saying you can play 60% of hands here, um, whereas uh, GTO Wizard's saying a bit less than that. Okay, so let's review everything that we have in terms of data. I mean, let's focus on the button because it's probably going to be one of the most important. We've got 42% for Munka, 39% for Snowy, 42% for Wizard, and 41.5% for Texas Solver. So one of the key points I wanted to take away from this is, does it matter which one of these solutions that you're using? Probably not. It does seem snow is consistently tight, but we're talking about two or three percent, and there could actually be a reason for that. It might just have slightly different rake parameters, or we know it's maybe forced to use larger bet sizings in some spots compared to the others. So that could be why it's tight. But these solutions are so similar that it really doesn't matter whether you're using the Munka button RFI or whether you're using the, the wizard button RFI, for example. Let's compare two of those side by side. Uh, let's go back to our original wizard preflop solution. So we're going to pull up, um, we're going to pull up the button here and compare it to Munker. So this is going to be obviously one of the most important ranges because late position open. I mean, small blinds important as well, obviously. So let's have a look at the button RFI range. This is still the heat map. So let's put it back to strategy, and you can see the button RFI range: forty-two percent recommended, two point five. Okay, so let's. Let's put that on one side of the screen. And uh, let's pull up Munka. And uh, if we go back, so this was button fold. So if you go to cutter folds, then we should have the button our fire range 42.5. Now, one of the annoying things again, if we're talking about pros and cons, is I literally cannot make this range any bigger right now. Um, it's tied to the size of the of the window. So unless I make it full screen, that's about as big as it's going to be. Um, plus side is it does actually show us EVs if you hover over. So you can see like the EVs of different holdings, but you know, in terms of having it nicely output as a heat map, this is obviously easier to look at. 
Um, but first of all, let's just have a look around the edges of the range to see if there's any big difference. And what you see is they're surprisingly similar. I mean, notice how Jack-4 is mixed here. Jack-4 suited is mixed over here. Uh, queen do suited is not played in the Monk Soul button RFI. And you can see it's one of the hands that's mixed in GTO Wizard. There's a lot of mixing that happens around the offsuit 8 combos. So King 8, Queen 8, Jack 8, 10 8, and 9 8 are all mixed. Look how they're mixed here as well on the Monk Arrangers. King 7 also mixed. Both of them agree that King 6 should not be an open on the button. Pocket pairs, it's funny how the mix is almost 50% at 2s and has 3s plus in the spot. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Like you might think 2s is a slam dunk button open, while according to both solos, it's basically 0 EV to open pocket 2s on the button. Um, Ace 3 again mixed, but Ace 2 soft suit not in the range. So does it matter if you are paying 100 bucks a month to use this solution? Or downloading this solution on the left for free? It really doesn't make that big of a difference. I think anything outside that's just going to be marketing. Most important thing is that you work with the solutions and, and try and understand what the meaningful takeaways are. So to give you some examples of that, things that we've learned in this session. Firstly, we know that we can open raise wider from UTG and MP than our master or exploitative ranges suggest. So we often say, and these are kind of numbers from before we even really had GTO preflop solved ranges, maybe 13, 14 for here and 18 for here. But according to the solvers, consistently, this is like 17 to 18%, okay? So you can open raise wider there. Um, MP, we often say 18. The solver is saying, actually, you can open raise 21 from these spots, okay? These are probably going to be some of the most accurate recommendations for RFI numbers that um, we have because they're based on solver analysis, right? This is not what humans think. This is kind of like what humans think and what works well in practice, but uh, what we get to see a picture of now is how poker is actually supposed to be played in these spots. Uh, cutoff, we usually say 27. Well, guess what? That's pretty good, right? 27? Solver says, yeah, 27. That's fine. Button, we say 48% plus. Um, you know, going back 5, 10 years, there were lots of discussions about winning players opening 70% of hands on the button consistently. And you can see why that would work for exploitative reasons. But GTO is actually saying, you're not really supposed to open 50% of hands on the button. It's just too many. You can't defend it properly against a 3-bet. So that's another takeaway. If you have very, very tough opponents in the blinds, you do not need to be opening 50% of buttons just because the exploitative ranges say that. Those are higher than GTO values as we've seen. So you've got two cyan tags or two guys in the blind that just seem to be very good and are giving you trouble. We'll start out with this 40% RFI range. You do not want to be opening 50% because then their aggression is just paying off for them because they're three betting a lot and they're actually exploiting the fact that we can't defend that overly wide 50% range because GTO says here, you're supposed to open 42% of hands from the button. So those are the kind of general takeaways we like. Another example is the sizing we've seen and this is confirmed and we always love it when stuff is confirmed across the neural network and the solvers because when both differently calculated sources confirm the same thing that means you're onto something like you found a general truth about the game and in this case it's this increase of sizing in later position and this is a common question that always gets asked is what sizing plan should i use and usually the answer is it doesn't matter too much and you know, exploitatively, in most games, it probably doesn't really matter too much. But what we can see now through the, the clearer lens of GTO and working with neural networks is that there is actually a default answer. And the default answer is that you want to size down in general in earlier positions and you want to size up in later positions. Now, one thing that's kind of missed here across all four of these preflop solutions is none of these preflop solutions offer the solver the chance to use multiple sizings preflop. So if the solver had the option to raise to 2.5 or raise to 3.5, for example, in the button, would it make use of both sizings? Would it sometimes open to 2.5? Would it sometimes open to 3.5? We don't know because what's happened here is someone's probably compared different sizings. They probably run a model with a 2.5x open. They then run a model with a three big blind open. They've run a model with a min raise. 
They've compared the EVs and they've said, okay, 2.5 is the best performing open size on the button. We're going to give that size to our solver tree. And that's why we're here now looking at 2.5 button RFI. But it still only has one choice. It can still only use that particular sizing as part of this tree. So would a GTO solver use 2.5 and 3 big blinds with some frequency if it was given the choice? Would that actually increase the EV of our overall strategy? So this doesn't prove that we shouldn't be doing stuff like, you know, mostly min raising from UTG and then sometimes making it pot size, for example. That doesn't disprove that. Same on the button. Should we always make it 2.5 with our entire range? Or should we sometimes min raise, sometimes make it pot size? Again, this doesn't prove or disprove that. Uh, it's possible that we're supposed to use more than one sizing. But as a very general takeaway that you could implement immediately in your game, you want to be investing more chips when raising first in on the button and less chips when raising first in UTG and MP. Small blind, if you do raise, it wants to be relatively large. Probably wants to be three big blinds, unless you have an exploitative reason for going smaller. Like, you know, if big blind just wants to fall 80% range to the min raise, then that's fine. You can just min raise from the small blind and print money that way. That's okay. You're doing that for exploitative reasons. But generally, you want to be making it probably three big blinds from the small blind and not making it too cheap for your opponent to play lots of pots in position against us. Finally, small blind completing, which is not the topic of this session, but um, compared to, you know, again, thinking about what humans think versus what GTO is telling us, um, we kind of humans think 70%, right? But it appears Solver saying actually play 50 to 60% of hands in that spot. You can't quite complete 70%. If you do raise first in, and uh, humans would generally say 36% for this. That's pretty good, but the solver's saying, no, actually, raise more aggressively than that. And you know, just to give you a little bit of poker history that you may or may not be aware of, when Poker Snow was first released, one of the big major criticisms, and it's probably persisted to this day where there's still this hatred towards neural networks, like, you know, it's not a real solver, that kind of thing, was because when it was first released and you'd have a look at these ranges, you would look at button and it would have this 36% RFI on the button. In fact, let's see what we were given today for Snowy. 39, so Snowy's actually more aggressive than it used to be when it was first released, however many years ago that was. You get 36% on the button. And then when you looked in the small blind, you'd get around 40%. And you can see snow is kind of actually you would get you would get more than 40 percent if i remember correctly you would get close to 45 percent um in the small blind and you know snow is kind of tightened up from that you can see it's now at 40 percent but you can imagine someone who has been playing poker for a while you know think not now like think like five ten years ago before we had access to this data and they just know that buttons are supposed to be open about 40 percent small blinds are supposed to be open 36 percent of the time then they fire up this software that's claiming to be like the best poker tool ever and it crushes everyone and you know the testimonials are some actually some of the testimonials for snowy i don't know if you guys remember this used to actually have jungle man as part of their ad and i don't know how much they paid jungle man but like his role in the advert was to sit there and just look really confused while snowy was doing all of this stuff and like jungle man would be scratching his head like is it's as if to say he was being crushed by Poker Snowy. And you know, obviously, if you know Jungle Man, there's probably some skepticism there. Was Jungle Man really being crushed by Poker Snowy? Or did they just, you know, put half a mil in his bank account and tell him to look confused? Anyway, you've got this tool that's meant to revolutionize poker. And, you know, you've been playing poker for five, 10 years, and you just know that button's supposed to have 48% and small blind's supposed to have 36. And you go into Snowy and you look at the button RFI range and it's 36. And you think, well, <laughs> that's super passive, right? And then you check out the small blind RFI range and you see it's like 45%. And that's got to be wrong, right? There is no way that the small blind is supposed to open raise more aggressively than the button. And people were just so convinced in what they knew that it was basically, well, this tool is rubbish, right? <laughs> it doesn't even know that you're supposed to open raise more aggressively from the button than the small blind. Come forward five to 10 years and we see that actually there's some truth in that. I mean, if you look at the button of small blind RFI numbers, they're very similar, right? Monk is saying 42, 43. So Monk is saying 
open raise a small blind more aggressively than you open raise the button. Snowy, I don't know what they did to tweak this. <laughs> it looks a lot closer now, but you have to trust me that back in the day, small blind was opening a lot more aggressively than the button. Small blind is more aggressive than this, button's more passive. I mean, the idea with the neural network is it gets refined over time, so that's presumably what's happened here. I don't think they've tweaked it just to keep their players happy or anything like that. Um, Gicho Wizard is still saying, you know, open the button a bit more aggro than the small blind. Uh, Texas Solver is saying, open the small blind more aggressive than the button. So the point is that we are supposed to, it's actually close, right, between button and small blind RFI ranges. It's not like obvious that we should open raise the button more. So general takeaways with our current exploitative ranges relative to GTO is probably want to be opening the button a bit tighter than we think. Probably want to be open raising the small blind a bit wider than we think. Although to be honest with you, um, most of you guys are probably opening 40% small blind RFI anyway because... Uh, to be honest, when we take something like button 48%, we usually cite that as the minimum value and say that good players on the button are going to be opening 55-60% because they're finding good spots to open raise wider. And it was always the same with a small blind. Uh, 36 was the default minimum value, but good players would be opening 40%, maybe 43-44%. So. But just keep in mind, GTO value is about 40% and it's actually very similar to the button. Um, I wonder if we just compare those ranges as well. Uh, what we kind of see. So just as like a, a final thing to finish off here, we'll just compare a small blind and button RFI range. If you have any questions, guys, now would be a good time because we're about to wrap things up. Hopefully this is giving you some things to think about for RFI strategy. So this is the button RFI range. You know what? Let me just make that sixes not be giant for some reason. Okay, so we're just going to pull up we're going to pull up this here and we're going to switch this over to small blind RFI. Well, you can see the small blind range in red. And another cool thing you can do here is you can actually remove some of the ranges. So we're just left with the raising range. Um, just compare those. Now we know there's some mixing here because some of these hands are limped, right? That's why they're not occupying the full amount of the grid. We're just comparing the two red sections. To be honest, this is basically the same range, right? There's some difference. I mean, for some reason, 8.5 and 9.5 like to get opened from the small blind. So there are small differences here and there. But what we're pretty much looking at is the same range. So. Another takeaway here is if you want to simplify it by having the same default RFI range from these spots, that's probably not going to be a super bad thing. Having said that, I would try and get away with opening the button significantly more aggressively than we're supposed to. But just understand you've got this fullback where you can basically just play 40% of holdings or even slightly less if there are two very good players in the blinds. Okay, um, let's see some questions. Modesto says, what if you add a row and the Excel calculate an average of the four values? Maybe it's interesting. Well, you can try that. Uh, I think we want to... Oh, I see what you mean. So like an average here of each value. Yeah, sure. Now, let me just recap on my Excel functions. An average function here. Oh, right. Seems fairly simple, doesn't it? Wait, did that work? <laughs> yeah, this is not working, is it? What have I done wrong here? Let me just make sure it's averaging the right rows. So average of B4 to E4, right? There you go. Fact, I can probably do this now. There we go. I guess those are our official RFI frequency numbers then, all right? 17.5 from UGG, 21.2 from MP, 27.57 from cutoff, 41.28 from button, and 40.88 from small blind. Mode says, in the past, I have 48% open from button, and in the session review, you say I'm kind of passive. Last month, I'm happy and open 55% from the button. Now I don't know what to think. 
So remember, we're talking about GTO poker, right? This does not mean that you want to be opening 40% of buttons, okay? You want to be happy that you've increased your aggression. What we're saying here is if you have very good opponents in the blinds, it's okay to open 40% of hands from the button. So I just want to take you back because it's very important you don't take this out of context. The goal here is not really to play GTO. It's to employ useful GTO principles when it's relevant. So a relevant situation could be that you have two very good players in the blinds. So to take you back to what we're mentioning at the beginning of the session to wrap things up. We try and play exploitatively at every part of the game tree, but against very good opposition, your exploits are more likely to occur at later points in the game tree. So if you have a very good opponent, they probably work pretty hard in pre-flop. Uh, they maybe even have some kind of GTO simplified flop strategy that they're using. You're not going to exploit that. It's designed to be unexploitable. They're probably going to end up lost on the Turner River though, and that's where you're going to be able to generate your exploitative strategies. So against most opponents, exploit on every street as best if, as best as you can. Against more advanced opponents, it could be play an approximation of GTO on the earlier streets, but then attack weaknesses on the later streets when they're vulnerable. There's no point trying to exploit someone who's doing a very good job of playing pseudo GTO strategies on pre-flop or flop betting rounds, right? We know people have got these systems going where they're playing almost perfect GTO ranges pre-flop, then having some kind of unexploitable flop strategy where they maybe just see bet their range for one third pot. You're not going to be able to exploit that. It's designed to be virtually unexploitable. You're going to be able to exploit them on the Turner River though. But understand that we're only talking about 5% of opponents or less. So a lot of this is going to be most useful for players who are playing very high stakes because if you're playing anything that's not high stakes, you will want to open raise more aggressively on the button. But having said that, many of the principles are useful for everyone. For example, increasing your open raise sizing towards later position. That's just going to be useful for everyone, no matter what limit you're playing. Having a rough idea of what GTO frequencies look like, it's going to be useful for everyone as well. And you know, how they stack up against our exploitative RFI ranges. But button, if you're opening 55 in the button, that's fine. Key adjustment here is you've got two sign tags in the blinds or you've got two very good players in the blinds, you don't need to default to 48%. You can now default to 40% or slightly lower, which is going to make you much tougher when you defend against three bets from aggro blinds. BBW saying 57 over large sample. So the thing is here, you can also just check your win rates, like with hand to note. If you're opening wide on the button, fire up hand to note and have a look at the win rate of those weakest hands on the button. And if they're making you money, which they probably will be, then cutting them out of your range just because GTO says 40% button RFI, that doesn't make any sense. You're just damaging your win rate for no reason, right? So it's very important you only apply these concepts when it's relevant and don't just do GTO stuff for the sake of it, right? Hopefully everything in the course so far, you've, you've understood that it's mostly driven by exploitative concerns. We want to exploit people. We don't want to play GTO generally. All right, cool. Thanks for your attention, guys. Good luck with the grind. See you next session.